change our agenda, we're just going to talk about bridges. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so it's culverts. Culverts. Culverts and bridges. That's all we're going to talk about today. So. Well, I thought it was here, so that's why everybody else is on that. That's right. You drop by the crowd. I hear you. Thank you, son. Okay, we're going to get started this morning. Transportation Climate Initiative. And Matt Soda, Executive Director of the Mont Fuel Deals Association, is the number one on our list. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to yes. talk about the Transportation Climate Initiative. Okay. Well, just briefly for the senators and for many members of their watching, um, what is the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association? We're a nonprofit trade association of 250 members, less than 100 of them actually sell fuel. Um, um, they're members because we do training for heat techs. We train over 1,000 techs a year that work on your burners in your basements. Um, we do background testing for truck drivers and drug testing and alcohol testing. Um, members join the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association because they have access to this, which stores a lot of information about Vermont's rules regarding the delivery of fuel, um, propane, heating oil, gasoline, um, which are very specific to Vermont and very complex. Um, we participate in the uh, Transportation Climate Initiative discussions because many of our members also sell diesel fuel and gasoline. Um, You're the wholesaler end of it, right? No. We're everything. Oh. Our largest member by employer is Efficiency Vermont. Uh, most of our members are 10 employees, you know, five trucks, sell two million gallons. Um, but from the terminals to the jobbers, which are the truck tra transport operators, to the rail systems, to the, to the retailer, to the person that sells the hoses and the nozzles, to the equipment manufacturers. Um, it's been a good uh, career for me the last 13 years, in part because of Vermont regulations are very specific, very complex, and I happen to know them. Congratulations. Yes, so we have a contract. So we represent Vermont Fuel Dealers Association, the executive committee, 17 members are mostly comprised of uh, retail propane and oil heat operations, but we also have a contract with the Vermont Grocers Association um, to provide regulatory and legislative assistance with regards to sales of gasoline. Um, but from large terminal operators in, in Vermont, like Global, um, to small gas stations, uh, to large heating oil providers, to small Cynthia. propane companies. Um, as you can imagine, they all don't agree um, on many issues, but they pay me $500 a dues a year so they can hear what I have to say. So we've commented on the Transportation Climate Initiative uh, primarily because it is both amazingly simple and extremely complex, right? I mean, the idea, some of the things that TCI gets right, I mean, if you're going to put a price at a cost to gasoline and diesel fuel, it makes a lot more sense to do it from a, from a federal perspective, like the oil spill liability tax that was enacted in 1986 to deal with any spills regarding after Exxon Valdez, you know, eight cents on a barrel. That makes sense because you're capturing it at the point of production and the point of import. Um, a regional is better, is not as good as a national, but it's better than a statewide average if you're going to collect it, unless you do it in the excise tax structure, which we currently have for gasoline and diesel. 56 cents on, on diesel fuel, 49 cents on gasoline here in Vermont. That's federal and state taxes. Um, our issues with TCI and, and the administration and, and all the people working on TCI have been very receptive and very forthcoming, um, and they're doing great work. But our concerns with TCI is, Fairness, right? So there's going to be, you know, you want, to, you want to make sure people pay the tax if it's enacted, but that they only pay it once, but that they at least pay it. And because of the complex structure of a regional approach, because of the way fuel flows into Vermont, um, that's something that we keep an eye on. So, for instance, a third of our fuel, heating oil, gasoline, kerosene, diesel fuel, is coming either by train or tanker truck directly from Canada, from Quebec, from the Valero refinery in Quebec. 
that's, going, that's being pipelined to the Montreal terminal. It's either being put on a rail car, and it ends up at the Global Terminal in Burlington, or the Valero Terminal, or the Rutland Terminal, run by Dead River Company. Or um, it's being put on a tanker truck and delivered straight from the Port of Montreal to Fred's in Newport. Um, and it's not going through that system. You also have a scenario where fuel's coming from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, from the, from the seaport there, much of that fuel coming from the Irving refinery in New Brunswick. Um, again, Canada. So what I'm, what I'm basically drawing is the way the fuel flows can come from the non-regulated entities, areas. If Massachusetts is in and uh, Barrels or Fleming picks up fuel in Springfield, Massachusetts and brings it back to Vermont, either the terminal or the fuel company that retails it in Brattleboro is going to pay the TCI tax fee, whatever. That's clean, that's easy. It gets a little bit more complex when we deal with fuel flows that are coming from New Hampshire if they don't participate, in Canada, which is a major supplier for Vermont. Um, so those are some of the issues that, that frankly, the administration, the agency natural resources has been listening to and they're attentive to it. The idea that terminal operators are gonna pay this regardless, and Vermonters are gonna pay this whether we accept the money or not, is flawed in our opinion. Because if that does happen, if you can, how do you capture fuel from Canada? How do you capture the tax from fuel that coming from Canada that's sold in Vermont by a retailer if they're not the position holder and if we have no authority to tax Canada or enforce this in Canada? And if this is, and it gets more substantial than the, the trucking cost, um, which can be substantial, you're not gonna drive from Alabama to Canada because you're going to pay 25 cents less a gallon because of the trucking costs. But at some point, you'll divert those trains and those tractor trailer trucks to the non regulated areas, New Hampshire, Canada, uh, to the detriment of companies selling fuel and, and, or they'll just purchase assets in those areas to shift the way the fuel flows. These are things that we think about because we want to make sure it's a level playing field. Whether you do it through a TCI, whether you do it through a federal tax, a state tax, or a regional tax, our concern has always been tax fairness. Leakage, leakage not in the literal sense, but the figurative sense. Tax leakage is when people see an opportunity, industry sees an opportunity to get a price advantage by going to a different area uh, and avoiding paying the taxes that we, we should be enforcing, we should be collecting. So TCI gets it from a regional approach um, rather than a state by state. Um, but there's a regulatory infrastructure that has to be created, I don't know how much that's gonna cost, to ensure that the taxes is paid, the fee is paid, and that it's paid at least once, but only once. I just, uh, you first described it as the price of the program, which is probably more appropriate than a tax or a fee because it's not a tax or a fee. Right. Um, and your point is well taken about making sure that you we that the system would reduce leakage and people avoiding participating in what is meant to capture everybody. Um, when Peter Walk was here giving, from the administration's point of view, the people who have been at the table trying to give a sense of where things stand, and it's not a final deal yet, so it's still there's, there's things being um, I don't know, fine tunes the right word, but they're still working through different problems, and it is, it is both complex and simple, as you described. Um, the um, concerns you've raised um, with some, in, in expressing in some more definitive ways, um, were not the way they were expressed to us by the person at the table who was saying, of course, we have to be uh, mindful of all these concerns. Um, but was, but, but was not here saying that um, a state like New Hampshire, if they choose to not participate, would somehow pay a different price at the pump for the broader uh, TCI effort. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if, you, uh, if your members or your association uh, knew that states in and out were going to uh, be affected the same way and there was a way to only have people pay once and not you know, pay twice, and that it captured all the fuel that was coming in, would your members then support TCI? Those great. are the concerns you've identified. If those were issues that um, the people at the negotiating table resolved satisfactorily in each one of those ways, would, would the fuel dealers support TCI? So let me 
get to that question, but go the end around. Under that scenario, which I think is correct, they would have to regulate the enterer, not just the terminal, right? So it's, we're not talking about the terminals in Montreal or Portsmouth or Albany or Boston. We're talking about the enterer, which is not necessarily a large player. That could be a small player, S.L. Dudley with a tractor trailer truck in Barry. That's, that is an enterer. He's bringing it from a non-attainment area or a non-regulated area into Vermont. That's, that's problematic. So that's, that's the first reason why for, for small companies, Vermont companies, to be in this field where they're purchasing allowances um, with very sophisticated uh, players. Um, that's problematic for me, personally. If no administrative s scheme is created that would simplify that for them. Yeah, I think yeah. simplifying yeah. makes, uh, the further you push this upstream, yeah. the more it makes sense. Right. We just approved, President Trump just signed in the tax extenders bill, putting back into place, it was gone for two years, the oil spill liability tax, which is the most sensible and efficient way to put a price on petroleum at the federal level. Now, I understand we're not going to have this under the current administration. Right. But as you go further downstream, <coughs> the more complex it is from a regulatory standpoint, our opinion, mm -hmm. my opinion. Um, and um, the further you have a chance for leakage, um, and the idea that we're putting some of these small players in the soup with some very sophisticated financial entities who are going to be buying and trading allowances I don't feel that they'll have much success. And I, in my heart, I support large businesses, small businesses, but in my heart, you know, I realize that some Vermont entities who are going to pay this fee, allow purchase allowances, however you want to define it. Um, well, I'll define it as not a tax or a fee because it's not a tax or a fee. Okay. So I'll start by saying what it isn't, a tax or a fee. Okay. It but, might be a quibble. There would be a price impact, so I do not right. dispute that. But they will have to purchase allowances. It won't be just the terminal operators that purchase allowances. It will have to be the small, enterers as defined by the TCI language, and, and I have no confidence that they'll be able to be play in that sophisticated market uh, with some larger entities. And I, from their perspective, this is not going to work for them. It may work for some other more larger sophisticated uh, uh, terminal operators. Senator I'm, un I'm not understanding why it has to be so complicated. Why can't they just buy the allowances? those enterers. What, why is that wrong? You're bringing in X gallons of heat or transportation fuel, you pay Y allowances. That's the trend, that's the, that's the trend. Well, right? Yeah, this is a brand new concept, not for the large players, but for the small enterers, importers, mm -hmm. truck drivers. Um, not the truck drivers, unless they own the company. Yeah, to go talk to Steve Dudley. Senate Perchlick in Barry. Right. The idea of, of Steve and me walking through, through purchasing allowances, um, and I, this isn't a, a slight on some of our members. They're keeping trucks on the road. They're keeping fuel in our terminals. They're keeping fuel in our tanks. They're, they're making the Vermont's economy run. They're doing important work. But to say that they have time to figure out, they have the ability um, to figure out the allowance market that, that we're basing this on. I mean, when we created Reggie, um, we're dealing with power producers. We're counting electrons very simply. Um, this is different. This is different than Reggie. Um, and it is, there's a level of sophistication here that we may understand in this building or across the street or at A&R, but the person who's worried about making sure he's got a, a driver who can pass a drug test and doesn't have any felony convictions and is ready to, to run, that's a little bit different than saying, okay, now you're gonna get into an auction, a regional auction, with the major terminal operators. I mean, right, but that's where he hands over the keys the and says. Is, yeah, but the, the auction is, is setting the price. And then it, it can, I think it can be simplified to, to Senator Ash's point. Like if we can simplify it so we're not at the border asking the truck driver to do a calculation and enter an auction and s figure that all out. I, I think it can be simplified to where it's like, here are the, here are the amount of gallons that you're entering here's the allowance price, unless you're gonna be mixing it with biodiesel or whatever, there's different options, so you don't have to buy as many allowances. And then that, that would be the option for them to, to figure that out. Right, it's my understanding that much like the Reggie auction, there'll be quarterly opportunities to purchase, and the price will fluctuate much like buying stock in 
or buying a commodity. Um, and the more sophisticated players will be able to buy, buy, buy more allowances for less. And the ones that wait until the, the 45th day, or whatever, the, the 90th day, 89th day, um, may, not, may not perform as well. And that will have an impact on their operation. No, no, I agree. So I don't think it's as simple as we want it to be. Can it be? Perhaps. Right. And I agree that the, the smaller operations are going to have more work to do, and it's going to be a little, a little more difficult for them to figure out on the long term and banking and the other other things that will be part of it. There's no, no doubt. But I think it can be simplified towards it's not going to be that complicated. But they might be, I don't know if they're going to be at a competitive disadvantage in the auctions or not. But I could see why it would be concerned of some of your members. Is any thought being on a national level? Is any thought being this nationally? Not, not even on the well, not under this administration, okay. certainly not. But it's not like there a federal tax is or a state tax. I mean, there are existing taxes. They just or fees or 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't mean to use the language of the. To me, I just think it's not accurate if we call it a tax or a fee. It's a, it's a cost of doing business, an added cost of doing business for those that distribute gasoline and diesel fuel. There's no question. And there's lots of added costs of doing business. And that's if the emissions targets aren't met and allowances are even needed. And I think when Peter was here, one of the other things he said, which was actually really interesting, was the extent to which all the states who participate meet the emissions goals, there might be no price of the allowances because they don't have to sell them. Now they would reset, so there'd be this constant attempt to to move innovation and drive people to have fewer emissions, unquestionably, but um, it's the plot is always thicker. And I, I've actually appreciated that the governor's position has been he wants to see the final agreement to know how it would work for all the different the small guys, the big ones, and so on. And I think that's one of the reasons we're reserving judgment, too. And I just I feel like um, the more certain people talk about how all the details are going to be worked out, the farther it is from where things really stand. We don't know how simple or complicated it would be for the small person bringing it across the border. And I think we'd be concerned if it was really complicated and putting them at a competitive disadvantage. But when does that happen, Senator I think, I think April is when they think that there will be a final thing put on the table for states to decide one way or the other. And of course, that could lead into May. I mean, these things aren't simple. They're, they are complicated. They've got a lot of public input from everybody from the mass group to everybody else. So I don't know if that's going to happen. Doing it nationwide, nationwide. California. Well, California um, is in a different program. But the 12 states that are considering it, um, there's still some uncertainty about what would happen to a New Hampshire. And I actually, I think the governor of New Hampshire is very strange to say I don't support something, even though I don't know what it is yet. Um, and I don't know if it's good or bad for the people of the state, but I oppose it anyways. Okay. So. It's unclear which states will join forces, I think. Um, it, it, but it seems like April is probably the soonest that the final, yes, final deal will be on the table. Matt, do you have, other, do you have recommendations? Like, you, you identified a problem, but the, uh, the, is, is your solution just not to do it? Or, is, or do you think there's ways to make it better? Well, I mean, there's certainly advantages with other, for instance, California's brought up. California's a low carbon fuel standard. Where has that effect? What's the effect of that? It's been effective moving renewable diesel, biodiesel, from where it's created in the Midwest to California. I mean, we play in that market for heating oil, right? Mm -hmm. We blend renewable diesel and biodiesel into the heating oil supply if it's a cost advantage or if the customer requests it because they want to lower their carbon footprint. Um, the low carbon fuel standard, the way that California has been able to meet its mission goals is through renewable diesel, largely for their trucking market, for trucks. That's another way that we could increase the amount of, and then there's buy-in from the sellers. Right now, what you're asking is, can we add a cost to you that will reduce the sa your sales? I mean, that's essentially the bargain that we've had. We, we don't really have an opportunity as sellers um, in order to encourage our customers to use a renewable option other than to install um, car chargers. But you know, based on what we know about our retail industry, most people, when they convert to cars, and they will, we, we, we're not blind here. We understand that in the next 10, 20 years, we're going to have 50,000 autos that are electrically powered, our snowplow trucks. The future is good for diesel. 
not so good for gasoline. We sell, we used to sell 350 million gallons of gasoline. We sell 300 million gallons, 310 million gallons now. We could easily see what will be at 260 million gallons uh, once 50,000 cars on the road. We understand this. You're going to see changes in the marketplace. You're going to see in rural areas, gas stations are going to close because they can't support the volumes that they're selling now. You're going to see more consolidation in the industry. It has to happen. When you sell less product, um, uh, business owners have to make a choice of whether they can sell at the increased regulatory costs. And it's not just the cost of TCI. It's the cost of tank compliance, uh, piping, all these standards that we have. Um, so you're going to see fewer gasoline stations. You're, we're going to see fewer sales of gasoline, we, our diesel sales will remain constant because there's no adequate substitute for diesel except for renewable diesel and biodiesel. Uh, and at that, at that level, you can only go to 20% um, right now. electric and diesel is also replacing? I saw UPS just ordered 2,000 trucks here. I don't, don't you see some of that diesel part going also, right? Not, not what I'm saying. Really? I mean, yes, there, it, it, there's always a, a, a flashy article in American Trucking Association's magazines about right. the new Tesla truck or others, but we are going to be using diesel to haul milk for another 50 years. Really? We're going to be using diesel to haul logs out of our woods for another 50 years. We, we, won't, we won't need gasoline for a, for a car, uh, but we're going to need diesel, oh, diesel like trucks. Gas or propane, or is that a growing? It, you know, propane auto gas, they have tried, uh, they've tried to encourage that. It's not, but, less, not much less emissions, I noticed, from natural gas versus diesel. Yeah. Well, when it comes when it comes to sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxide, it's because we went to an ultra low sulfur standard, both okay. in heating oil and diesel fuel. So there's less of that, but that doesn't have anything to do with carbon. Okay. And to back to my question, is there a solution to make it better that you guys have, or is your recommendation not to do it? I'm not clear. You haven't said that for a lot. Uh, at TCI, again, I, I take Senator Ash's point very well. We don't know the final. I, I'm pushing back against the narrative that says no Vermont company is ever going to pay this. Because I, I just see tremendous leakage. If I get leakage is a term associated with tax. Yeah. It, well, actually, a tremendous ability for, for Vermont companies to avoid the added additional cost of complying with TCI if they have no burden on themselves because they can go to non-regulated areas very easily, and they do not. Um, the solution, of course, is at the federal level. And, I, and, the say, and, we, can and we could say the same, I would say the same thing about the excise tax. I mean, at the end of the day, we're looking at taxing capacity to fix our roads because those Priuses and those Teslas still use pavement. Um, and we still need to fix the roads and bridges. I don't need to tell this to this committee. I apologize for on a soapbox here. But I mean, there is, there is a taxing capacity. We will, have, we will reduce our gallons by 40 million in the next 10 years. We will have to find money to fix those roads. The most easiest solution, the most equitable solution, so we don't have this cross-border nonsense, is for the federal government to do something. And perhaps we'll have something that will achieve that in January. I can, I, Senator Sanders, I'm sure, is on board with me. <laughs> so the fuel dealers are holding off whether they're saying yes or no on TCI. TCI right now, as presented, not finalized, okay. is problematic for us. Okay. Fair. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's a fair statement. I, I, it's a fair statement, and it's your right to have that position. In fact, you could meet the allowances with renewable fuel, like how much renewable, there's the 10% ethanol, like up to 10% ethanol in our gasoline now. So, so we, we're so at 10%, we're at, I was told that we're at somewhere below 10%. Well, so we're at, we're at a, 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 everyone thinks fuel deals with walk and lockstep. They do not. There's wide disagreement about what you sell and where you sell it from, right? So the ethanol industry wants to, uh, and the major uh, 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 producers, because of the renewable fuel standard, federal law, want to increase the amount of ethanol in the supply, right? As retailers on ethanol, we want less and that federal because tax got renewed recently. The, 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 the tax credit you can get for adding that's biodiesel. So that's biodiesel. So on ethanol, on ethanol, at ten percent, 
we have problems with our pumps and our seals and, and corrosion, anything above 10%. So if you're a retailer or you're, you know, you don't want to sell anything over 10%. That's why you always see up to 10%. Depending on the price of ethanol, the, the major refiners are pushing because they have an alternative compliance payment if they don't meet the renewable fuel standard obligation to blend 9 million or 9 billion gallons into the supply, they're pushing as much ethanol as possible. Some of the best selling gasoline stations are ones that offer ethanol free gas, you know, because a lot of people don't want ethanol. But the refiners do. Retailers, we don't. We just cut us off at 10%, no more. They're trying to lift that to get to E15, and we're very much opposed to that on the federal level. The biodiesel, it's the other side, right? We need more biodiesel. On the heating oil industry, we have a pathway to get to net zero. We see a possibility where we can sell 100% renewable diesel fuel and heating oil. It's the same thing, all this difference is color. Right, we throw red dye into heating oil and off-road, into diesel fuel for off-road and, and heating oil use. It's just diesel fuel. So we see a pathway where we can put 100% renewable diesel, biodiesel, into tanks in our basements or underground where it's warm, and we can use it as a heating source. We see a bright future for the heating oil industry, selling renewable liquid fuels. With biodiesel, you're capped at 20%. You're capped at 20% because of two things. One is the engine manufacturers will not, will not go over 20% on current engines. Now that could change. They could, they could figure out a way to do it. If they're incentivized to do it, if they realize that the electric tractor trailer truck's not gonna work. So let's figure out how to get a more renewable fuel into our engines. And number two, those trucks are parked outside. And the problem with biodiesel, as you know, is that it clouds. And, 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 and the, an engine manufacturer, replacing an engine on a tractor trailer truck is gonna cost you upwards $80,000. Replacing a burner or a seal on a heating oil tank, which isn't gonna happen because those tanks are generally warm, is gonna cost $20. So for the heating oil industry, we see a real opportunity to bring more renewable fuel back to the East Coast, although we're competing with California now. Um, uh, we just got the biodiesel tax credit back. President Trump signed it. We lobbied aggressively for it. But you don't see an opportunity for biodiesel mixing as in the diesel? Yeah, we do. And that's going to happen. And, and under TCI parameters, biodiesel gets a break. Right. So that's positive. I, again, I, I started this saying there's some things TCI got right, and that's one of them. Right. Also, a regional approach rather than a state by state approach. Um, you know, but if I'm advocating on behalf of my small um, transporters, retailers, enterers, and they're told that they're not gonna have to pay anything. It's all gonna be done by the big bad terminals down in another state. I'm saying to them, that's not how I read it. Right. Yeah. No, they will have to do something. I, and I, the, the question of who, who remits dollars to the administrative entity managing TCI is an interesting question. Ultimately, the consumers will bear whatever the cost is. Um, and so I, in some ways, I, it's the compliance and treating everyone equally on a level playing field, which I think is your most salient point in that regard. Um, but, but I do want to just express one thing, which is, you know, we might have different views, your association and me, I'll only speak for myself, in terms of being positive or pessimistic about whether this can be arranged in a way that is most favorable for the state of Vermont. I happen to be positive that it can be done, and I hope it is. And if it's not, I'll say it wasn't done right. Um, but I do think that at its core, the, our, our job is to reduce transportation emissions. And that, that's where um, sometimes the, the details which are critical um, mask a, a step back question, which is what is the ultimate point of all this, which is to reduce transportation emissions in the most effective, lowest cost way. And that's where it's hard because there are some who say, just do nothing and let things take its course, and maybe, maybe the market will figure it out. And the, the patience and of the planet is probably not, the, there's, something, there's something misaligned there in terms of what we can really expect the market to just figure out. And I've, I've actually been very impressed by your members over the years. I'm thinking specifically about the, I, I don't know if the word innovation is the right one, but the reimagining their businesses to also get into repair and servicing and transitioning um, fuel supplies within homes and businesses. And that's obviously, there's gonna be more of that coming up on the transportation and the home heating side. And you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't think we take lightly that there are impacts 
and, and entities which will have to change and will be impacted for good or bad. And I think one of the commitments that we make is to um, not prop up harmful transportation emissions as a policy goal, but rather to make sure we're providing opportunities for those businesses to be playing in the areas where we're trying to direct people. And I, I know that a number of your members are attending Efficiency Vermont's trainings to get people certified in certain um, home heating things down at VTC, and there's probably more things like that we should be doing. Um, but I think we're, we're not on different pages in terms of understanding that there can be impacts um, to members and trying to make sure we're mitigating that to the best extent possible. I just wanted to express that. I appreciate that. Can someone give me a anticipated cost of what this might be per gallon at the pumps? Because that's going to be a big factor. Because people are going to judge it by what, 10 cents a gallon or 4 cents a gallon or 22 cents a gallon. Because we know that the headlines are going to be a carbon tax or an increase in gasoline. Would, Does anybody know at this time what that figure might be? They reported five to seventeen for gasoline and five to seventeen. That's a big fan. Yeah, it depends, depends which on, depends if you take the least aggressive reductions as the agreed upon amount or the most aggressive amount. So it's not like if we do the least aggressive, it'll range from five to seventeen. They're saying if you pick the least aggressive uh, tackling as emissions, four cents diesel. for Four cents for gas, six for diesel, diesel, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Well, that's a combination of the two, not just. The diesel was higher, so I think, yeah, gas It was four was cents four. for gas. That's at the 20. The hand, uh, you know, they had the three different target amounts, that, and it's not clear which one the states will say that they're going for. If they say the least aggressive of the three, it was four cents gasoline and six diesel, if my memory is certainly correct. Uh, and, that's if, and that's if the states don't meet the targets and require the full allowance amount to be on the market. And the money is spent by, decided by someone? By the states. And the state is who? Us. Transportation committee. You. Yeah. No, I'm just, I'm no it would be, it would be each, each state's appropriation process would decide how to spend the funds. And they haven't figured out the formula of how much each state gets yet, so that's another one of those variables we're still waiting to see. But the range we heard was about 15 to 20 million a year if I don't remember if it was specific to one of those targets or if it was just a general estimate. Do you have to meet certain goals uh, and emission standards? Is that what you have to That's your best agenda? Or no? If I may, yes. if, if, if the legislature or the governor decided it was in their interest to use the proceeds from TCI to spend on pension reform, pension, or transportation, or roads and bridges, yeah, no they technically no could, no but no one, one is. No one in the legislature there's is no restrictions. worried about using the money for... No, no, I'm just pension. saying, no, there's no restrictions no, know, placed on individual states to spend the money in ways right. they see fit, and, and, and presumably, under this legislature, the, the way it seems fit is to incentivize ways to get people to stop using gasoline and diesel if power. If the state vehicles. signs on, we would have legislation directing the money to be used for transportation investments. I, I can't see a different realistic path. And, and the other point to make about the cost, which is, it's you know not to be not to be sarcastic here. I'm already risking enough here. But when did you buy Bitcoin? You know, when did you buy your allowance? In, in Reggie, as I understood it, I understand it. When it first came out, the people that bought too many allowances were left with allowances they didn't need at the beginning of the Reggie auction. You know, there will be a time the the, the price of the allowances will flow during that 90-day period where you have that auction. And depending on when you purchase your allowances, that might change. You know, it might be half a cent. But that might mean something in terms of who, who successfully uses this TCI in order to um, improve their efficiencies in delivering this with this added compliance obligation. That's a cagey way of saying it's going to cost different position holders and different enterers different different amounts of money depending on when they play in the auction. If you wait until the last minute and you didn't buy any auctions allowances and there's none left, whoever bought them in the beginning is going to raise the price and you're going to get them. That's just how an auction works. And that's a good, I think that's a good thing because it provides more efficiency in the system. It yep. allows the market to work. And it encourage mm -hmm. innovation, encourage biodiesel. And there are opportunities in those markets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and which is to your point, like some people will be sophisticated. Yeah. 
that's a, if they can do it, if we can simplify, I think it's something we should think about or that the negotiators, and as Peter Walk said, that Vermont has an equal vote to the biggest states. You know, our vote isn't the same as Pennsylvania's, even though their fuel usage is whatever, 200 times as much. So we can, we can try to work on that. It, whether it's, we have a say, or, I, I get the feeling we're not gonna be able to deal with some of those rules we're going to say yes or no, but if there's things that we can do to support those small importers or enterers, then I think we should. But I appreciate that, Senator. No, no. Um, it's um, it's just raises a lot of um, uh, policy areas that need to be think thought through, and um, um, I, I was just thinking to some extent um, our small businesses. The extent to which they're uh, um, they're purchasing now, when you have bigger volume, you have more leverage within the market. I was thinking about <coughs> the companies that offer if you pre-buy and what they offer for rates. To some extent, there's got to be some um, s some similarities in terms of the sophistication, the volume, uh, what you have for leverage in the market, and uh, within the big players and not the small players. This is a good opportunity for the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association to offer this allowance trading services to your members. You can help them figure this all out. Or oh, you can be their um, you can agent. Be their broker. You can be their There's broker. Senate, but huh? he's Martin, expanding opportunities here. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate the advice. <laughs> 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 We'll take it under time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Comments from that? Thank you for a good Thanks, man. Thank you very much.